On Larry King Now, science's reigning superstar, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Why, why am I interested in space? Because I think it's fascinating. It's awesome. It's limitless. It's boundless. And it, it, it holds the seeds of, of everyone's uh, curiosity. What percentage of knowledge do we have? We look out in the universe and we look at all of the forces that are driving what's going on. We actually can quantify how much of that we know, and it's about 4%. Plus, is there life elsewhere? You run the numbers and you realize it would be inexcusably egocentric to suggest that we were alone in the universe. All next on Larry King Now. We're in New York. We're at the top of Trump Tower. Not a bad view on a beautiful day in October. And our special guest is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mr. Tyson is an extraordinary gentleman. The astrophysicist, a scientist with a million and a half followers on Twitter. The New York Times bestselling author hosts his own podcast called Star Talk. He's director of the famed Hayden Planetarium. When I was eight years old, they took me there. All little boys, we came from school. His new show is Cosmos. It debuts on Fox in early 2014. He's the recipient of 18 honorary doctorates and the NASA Distinguished Service Medal. That's the highest award given by NASA to a non-government citizen. Before anything else, I went, I grew up with a lot of guys. Not one wanted to be an astrophysicist. <laughs> I don't know where you grew up. <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn. Where did you grow up? Well, I actually grew up in the Bronx. It's the Bronx. And like it's, Colin Powell. You, he wanted to be a four-star general. You wanted to be an astrophysicist. Well, it's, it's when you grow up in the, you? Yeah, in the city, this, you don't have a relationship with the sky. You know, you look so up, how did you choose? What there's a that? building there. There's, back then, there was smog and pollution. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a first visit to the Hayden Planetarium. Really? That I now direct. As a kid. As a kid. As a kid. I was, All I was, kids in New York go to the Hayden Planetarium. At some point, you it's go a, through. It's a school trip. And I guess it doesn't hit everybody the same way, but it hit me sitting there in the chair, and the lights went out, and the stars came out. And, and I think the universe chose me after that. Really? Moment. Yeah, I don't think I had any say in the matter. So right then, you knew, I knew. this was your By life. By age 11, I figured out you can do it as a career. At, at age 9, you're not thinking career. You're just thinking what's what cool to do. What about it fascinated you? The, the vastness, the infinitude. Of it all. Infinitude. <laughs> I don't know if that word exists, but you know what I mean by it. It's a good it. word, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, just the idea that to understand it goes beyond Earth and requires methods and tools and, and, and talents. And, and then I'd learned you have to know math because the universe, the language of the universe is math. And figuring, out, figuring that out that early, it meant I didn't have any sort of math anxiety because I wanted to talk to the universe. <laughs> if you want to talk to somebody, you're going to learn their language, and there's oh. no fear factor at all. Something current, the, we're in the midst of a government shutdown as we speak. 97% of all NASA employees are furloughed. What are the implications? Well, I'm glad they're keeping the folks who are watching after our astronauts <laughs> on the space station. Somebody's got to like, watch after them. And, well, yeah. <laughs> and also, our, our, one of our next flagship missions, the James Webb Space Telescope, you might think of it as the follow-on to the Hubble Space Telescope. That was going through some crucial testing that they managed to keep a few of the employees uh, on, the NASA employees, who are monitoring those cryogenic tests. But it's not just NASA, it's the whole government. And I, you know, people like to blame the government, but this is a democracy, I thought, and we elect all of these people who just shut down the government. So well, we have a law uh, that they don't want to follow, so they shut down the government. Yeah, but otherwise, I think, if you really sort of part the curtains, we are behind all of this because we elected these people who shut down the government. Maybe we're electing the wrong people. Good idea. <laughs> I just... <laughs> why is... And this is asked by a lot of people. Why is NASA, in all of the problems we have in the world, poverty and hunger, why is, why is space important? Well, I think of space... Well, I, let me split that question. There's Why, why am I interested in space? Because I think it's... Fascinating. It's awesome. It's limitless. It's boundless. And it, it, it holds the seeds of, of everyone's uh, curiosity. I mean, to whatever extent curiosity is writ in our DNA, NASA fulfills the expression of that curiosity in, in us all. 
Don't tell me you've never walked out at night and looked up and just wondered in a stupor of how far away the stars are, what they're made of, are there, is there life out there? How did it all begin? How's it going to end? And as Kennedy said, we are made, we made to explore. But is it more important? Than so that's the my daily that's, that's why I do it. So now you want to get practical. Yeah, that's fine. Let's let, we can get practical. When I think of space, I think of a seductive force on us all, especially in the educational pipeline, that stimulates people to want to study science, engineering, math, and technology, the STEM fields, if I ordered that right, science, technology, engineering, and math. And that when you do that, whether or not you land in space, in a space activity, you have otherwise stoked the population with people who think differently from others. When we, for example, if, if a hurricane is coming, What's the first thing you say? Oh, let's run or buy toilet paper or let's buy up all the water from the convenience store. Yeah, that's one way to think about it. And another one is, how can we tap that energy of the hurricane so that it doesn't level the city? Maybe it can power the city. It would have otherwise leveled. How do we deflect that asteroid rather than asking where to run so you can hide from it? When you have scientists and engineers in your midst, different questions get asked and different solutions arise. Solutions that transform our culture, transform who and what we are to this Earth. Why didn't you become an astronaut? Uh, at the time, who are the astronauts? I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember the 60s, although I was really a participant in the 70s. And they were choosing these folks with like crew cuts, and they were military pilots. This is at a time when the Vietnam War was becoming less popular, and Hair was the number one musical on Broadway. I didn't feel like they were talking to me. Now they would take you. Oh, yeah. Well, they probably would have, possibly could yeah. have. But back then, there was no intersecting. Plus, where is NASA going at the time? They're going into orbit around the Earth. I'm saying, if you want to put me in space, take me somewhere. Do you think the public, the public represented in Congress, has turned away from NASA? A bit, I think. And it's to our own peril. Uh, not the least of which is the risk of asteroid impacts, one of which rendered the dinosaurs extinct 65 million years ago. You know if they had a space program, they would have figured out a way to deflect the thing. But they don't even have opposable thumbs, much less their walnut-sized so brain. So it's beyond them. It's that them, it's not beyond us. If we go extinct on Earth because of an asteroid impact, we'd be the laughing stock of aliens in the galaxy. <laughs> We'll be right back with Neil deGrasse Tyson. We've just started, and I wish I had seven hours. Don't go away. Our guest is the incredible Neil deGrasse Tyson. I don't know where to even go with this. It's so wonderful talking to you. That's my you, first time on your show. Oh I know, and it, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be many times. <laughs> okay. Like, I'd like to just go on and do shows with you. For a, We had a mutual friend, Carl Sagan. Was Carl a Sagan, oh, indeed. indeed. I knew all the early astronauts. I, I've been around. I was with I knew the Kennedy when he started the space program. No one denies that no. you've been around. <laughs> Keep it up, Neil. No, I, you know, you I learned from mad? others. Okay. <laughs> All right. I learned from others. <laughs> you get store. What is it like to become a celebrity astrophysicist? Yeah, I didn't even think those two words ever belonged. Well, you in became the, in, that in the same sentence. Right now, I get I get stopped by strangers in the street between 50 and 100 times a day. Who want to know what? And Well, what's interesting is they say, oh, are you the astro? Yeah, and, and the good part of that is most of the time they're saying, tell me more about the black hole that I heard you. And, and so really their object of interest is not me. It's the universe, and I'm just a conduit between them and the cosmos, serving up their, sh their smorgasbord. We have a mutual friend, Bill Maher. You go on. Bill Maher, yeah. yeah. I've been on a few, three times, yeah. This may seem stupid, but um, I, got a, I went to Lafayette High School. That's it. All right. Uh -huh. What do we know and what don't we know? What, 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 do, what percentage of knowledge do we have based yeah. on a scale of 100? We have no idea how much we don't know in any real terms. However... If we look out in the universe and we look at all of the forces that are driving what's going on, we actually can quantify how much of that we know. And it's about 4%. 4%. About 4%. So in other words, there are, there's phenomenon going on in the universe that to this day stumps us. And you add up all the stumping phenomena 
in the, in the cosmos, and this amounts to the dark matter. We don't know, 85% of all the gravity in the universe has a source about which we know nothing. We call it dark matter. With dark energy, the universe is accelerating in its expansion against the wishes of the collective gravity of all the galaxies. We don't know what's causing, we can measure it, but we don't know what's causing it. Add it up, it's 96% of all there is. So we're really on the precipice staring out into an abyss of ignorance. Speaking of Carl Sagan. Did I answer your question? Yeah, okay. yeah, I guess. <laughs> you're, you're gonna reboot Cosmos, huh? Yeah, yeah, for the 21st century. It's been 33 years. We're gonna do it. Say, well, we, we went all around the world. We're finishing up, actually, this month, the, the filming, and then there's the VO work and, and the, 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 the special effects and the, and the animations and the visualizations. So uh, we expect it to come out next spring. Uh, actually, airing on Fox. That's going to be great. Yeah, I, I so we, we all have very strong uh, hopes for it. And we have uh, Anne Druyan is the, is the writer. She's, she was uh, one of the co-writers of the original series. So we have genetic links back to the original. Of course, Carl is not with us. Wouldn't you want to go into space? I would, but if you can send me someplace. I don't want to, like, boldly go where hundreds have gone before, driving around the block as what the space shuttle had done. It'd be fun to see Earth, but... I'd rather wait until we can actually go somewhere. Take me to Mars, to an asteroid. How far are we? I want to ride a comet. When will we be there? And by the way, just to put this in context, if I take a schoolroom globe and ask you relative to that size, uh, how, how high up is the space station, space shuttle? It's three-eighths of an inch above a schoolroom globe. And somehow we're all convinced that that's space. No, not, not to me, not to an astrophysicist. And how far away is the moon? 30 feet away the full width of a room away. Mars, a mile away from a schoolroom globe, if it was shrunk to that size. Get are we gonna get there? I, there are only two ways we can get there. One is if China tomorrow says they wanna put military bases on Mars. And then we would go. <laughs> We'd be there in 10 months. One month to design, fund, build, and engineer the spacecraft. Nine months to get there. Uh, of course, you don't wanna go into space, I don't at least, we wanna go, war to be the driver, even though that's what drove us to get to the moon. We don't remember that era as being war-driven. Want to be the first. We, but we, we uh, the Russians were our threat, and the moon was the new high ground. So another uh, completely noble goal, at least in a capitalist culture, is you do it because there can be a strong economic return to your culture, to your nation. I had a psychologist tell me once, the day the world changed for America, was when Russia put someone in space before us. Completely, and in fact, if we were really candid with ourselves, we wouldn't actually remember our role in that space race as pioneers, because in fact, we were reactive. We were primarily reactive to they what went, Russia did, correct. not proactive. They put, a, they put a, a, a Sputnik, we go ballistic, literally and figuratively, and we, we found NASA. NASA was founded the same week I was born, so I feel a little connectivity there. Then they send up, put a human in orbit, we put a human in orbit. They put up, they just go right, they put the first non-human animal, we, everything we did was in reaction to them. We'll be right back with the extraordinary Mr. Tyson after this. We're back with Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson, who I promise you will either have his own show on Aura or will be with us frequently because I love guests like this, because it just boggles my mind. Are there people, are there, uh, is there life elsewhere? Well, if you, you just think? If you look at the numbers, just first, the ingredients of life on Earth, they're not special. We're made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. This, these are the most common ingredients in the universe. So you can't appeal to our special chemistry, because it's everywhere. Now, how many locations might you have life if life existed on a planetary surface? How many planets are out there? Well, we, we're, we've got an inventory in the making right now. The, the Kepler telescope, which recently, recently had some, some mechanical failures, but not before it gave us a list of a thousand planets out there orbiting stars that are nearby the sun. And that's just in our little pocket of the Milky Way galaxy. So, <clears throat> so you run the numbers, and you realize it would be inexcusably egocentric to suggest that we were alone in the universe. And so anyone who's actually studied the problem would say, sure, sure, there's, there's, 
the, the statistics strongly argue in favor of life. Now, whether it's intelligent life that we would call intelligent, here's, here's you want to lose sleep? Maybe there's life that's so intelligent, it doesn't consider us to be intelligent. We, hmm. def we came up with our own definitions of what intelligence is. Imagine they are so brilliant, they look at this as like... <laughs> Neanderthals. Ne Neanderthals. I they wouldn't even deign, <laughs> they wouldn't even waste their time. Any, any more th than you walk by a worm in the street that just crawled out gasping for air after a morning rain, or do you say, gee, I wonder what the worm is thinking? I wonder, no, you don't care. You, you step on the worm, right? So, so I, yeah. the hubris of us to suggest that we are intelligent, no other life on earth has ever been intelligent, and we can then have a conversation with other intelligent Is it life therefore on earth. hubris to believe in God? It would be, I think, if your God created the whole universe just to put you in it. Because you pose an interesting question. There was a, there was a monk back uh, just pre-Galileo, just a little pre-Galileo. Uh, his name is Giordano Bruno, who, who had just learned about Copernicus's work, that maybe the sun is in the middle of the known universe instead of Earth. Well, if Earth is just one of the planets and Earth has life, maybe other planets have life. Think about it. Once you realize that Earth is one of many, it opens up a whole world of questioning. And he said, well, if that's the case, then, and if all these lights in the night sky are suns just like our sun, then maybe they all have planets. Then maybe the whole universe is teeming with life. That got him into trouble. Because back then, religious philosophies did not allow the universe to contain any kind of intelligence beyond what God would have put can, here can on a, Earth. Can an astrophysicist be religious? Of course. Uh, well, any, I think... Religion has been with us since we came out of the jungle. But to right. believe in a judgmental God, someone hovering over so us? If you look at the numbers, I just tell you the numbers. The numbers, scientists on average are less religious than the population, okay? But that number is not zero. So then you ask, well, what does it mean for them to be religious? I tell you this, if they're active, contributing scientists, they're not running around telling you that the universe was made in six days. It's a different kind of religiosity that the scientist has. It's more of a spirituality, more a feeling of a creator, rather than using the Bible as a science textbook. Well, it's death that defies us, right? It's yeah, I mean, we... No we, death, no religion. Perhaps we, uh, we're, we're, we fear death, perhaps because we're mm. born knowing only life, right? So what else are we left to do but right. to fear that unknown? The... So what, all I'm saying is that the religious scientists are, they will, surely will have a spirituality about them, but it's not the kind where they're running around trying to change a science curriculum. Did your parents encourage you to do this? They didn't encourage anything. All they, uh, let me be very precise about this. They took, we, I grew up in New York City, rich with cultural institutions. We, every weekend, we went to the zoo, the muse Museum of Natural History, art museums, the opera, plays. We went to everything that adults do that is beyond just doctor, lawyer, Indian chief to show the full range, the dynamic range of what curious, talented people can do as adults. And in that, I got exposed to the planetarium. My brother is an artist. He was enchanted by the art museums. In fact, went to high school of music and art. Um, my sister's the one sellout. She went into corporate America. But what the, high school did you go to? Uh, I went to the Bronx High School of Science. Thank you. What Which, college? by the way, recently it logs uh, eight, we got our eighth Nobel Prize among what our What college did you go to? Went to Harvard and majored in physics, knowing all along that astrophysics would be that my That was way. not a black man's world. No, not at the time. And in fact, every one of my ambitions, when expressed in our culture, was... You know, I wanted to join the physics club. No, you looks like you're good at basketball. Why don't we, we'll set it up so that you can play on the basketball team and we'll send you rides back home from school. It was as though my interests were the path of most resistance. What did your father do? Uh, my father was active in the civil rights movement. And in fact, he became commissioner under Mayor Lindsay here in New York, uh, commissioner of the Manpower and Career Development Agency and the Human Resources Administration. So he was right there thinking about the youth in the ghetto, as, as the inner city was known back then. And so New York City didn't have the riots that you found in Watts and in, and in uh, Detroit over that period. There was a certain communication channel established between the what inner cities and, 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 
and, uh, and uh, City Hall. What was his first C name? Cyril. His name is Cyril deGrasse Tyson. I might have met him. I'll, I'll, I I'll, might I'll, have I'll, interviewed him. I'll, I'll ask him. I've done, I've been doing this 56 years, <laughs> and I interviewed many, many, many figures in the civil rights movement in uh -huh. the 60s. Uh -huh. I was in that movement. Was he was in a non-elective office, but yeah. he was in the back back room trying to get stuff done. By the, so, by the way, and my mother was a housewife with, who would later go to college once we were nearing empty nest. So there was no force operating saying, thou shalt be a scientist. But what they saw is that when I expressed this interest in the universe at age nine, they nurtured it. They didn't... They didn't make it what it was. They didn't they, say oh, you can't do it. They didn't say, exactly. And that's a different kind of way you raise somebody. I, 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 we all know people who became whatever it was because their parents were that, rather than became what they are because their parents nurtured their already expressed interests. When we come back, we'll take some social media questions for our extraordinary guest, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Don't go away. We're back with Neil deGrasse Tyson, the uh, director of the Hayden Planetarium, among thousands of other things, books, podcasts, and everything, and I hope he becomes a regular with us because I'm fascinated by all this. Before we get into these social media questions, uh, do you look at a glass as half full or half empty? I think that question is overplayed. And uh, the way I view it is, if you are in the process of filling the glass, it's half full. If you're in the process of drinking the contents that was in it, it's half empty. So that question, I think, can be enlightened by more information added to it. And then you can look at the trend line of what is going on, half empty or half full. It's like the chicken egg. We have an answer to that, too. But people keep thinking it's a deep, profound thing. What is thing. the answer? The answer is the egg came first. It was laid, but it was laid by a bird that was not a chicken. I'll think about that. Is it true that you only tweet in 125 characters or yeah, less? You don't I, tweet, use a... I tweet 125 characters, not 140. Not a, why is that? Because I, I, want, I don't want people to have to edit what I tweeted for them to retweet it. Lately, there are utilities where you can retweet without having to eat characters of RT space at Neil Tyson space. But RT space at Neil Tyson space, that's 15 characters. And if you're going to retweet it, I don't want you shortening my words into this ghastly abbreviation speak because my I want the words to be there. I so 125 characters, come sales right you on No, I'd like to put in a room together my late friend Steve Jobs and you. That would have been an interesting day. At Johnny Basher via Twitter wants to know, what would happen if the Earth stopped rotating for a second? Oh, yeah, that would be disastrous. Disastrous. Because right now, here in New York, you can calculate at our latitude, we are all moving with the Earth at 800 miles an hour due east. Because Earth is rotating. If you stopped Earth and you weren't seat belt buckled to the Earth, you would fall over and roll 800 miles an hour due east. It would kill everyone on Earth. People would be flying out of windows, and that would just be a bad day on Earth. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, now if, if, you, if somehow we all slowed down, so anything not bolted to the Earth would, would fly due east, 800 miles an hour. That's what happens to you in a car if you hit a brick wall and you're not wearing a seatbelt. You keep going. That's why you get hurt in those kinds of accidents. It's... But if somehow we all slowed down with the Earth, then... Okay, that's fine. I mean, people think, well, somehow we'll be weightless or we'll lose our atmosphere. No, it's just that you'll have really long days. At Ski Boot One asks, what's the thing that has surprised you most in the physics world? In the physics world, uh, I'm surprised. Can I give a cop-out answer there? I'm surprised that the United States could lead the world in particle physics for most of the 20th century and then just abandon that leadership. And now the most powerful particle accelerator is in Europe at CERN, the, the Center for, oh, the European Center for Nuclear Research. But if you spell that in French, it spells CERN. They're ahead and, of us. And, and they, that, it's that particle accelerator that found the God particle, the famous Higgs boson. And we're just looking over across the pond saying, oh, can we, a, a few of our scientists are on the project, but we're not the leaders of it. So you ask, what surprises me in physics? That we could, by vote of Congress, cede that leadership that quickly. And I'm, I'm astonished. I wonder, what country am I living in? It's not the one I grew up in. It's something different. 
I know it's a cop out answer, but that's how I oh, feel. Uh, Danger Dave seven twenty three tweets: What obstacles do we have to overcome in order to facilitate interplanetary travel? Oh. Okay, you know, Voyager just left the solar system, uh, the Voyager spacecraft, it was in all the news a few weeks ago, traveling fast, all right, and it's at this boundary between the sun's influence and the galactic influence, and so you can say, well, if you, if you hitched a ride on that, how long would it take you, because that's been going for 40 years, how long would it take you to get to the nearest star? The nearest star in a galaxy that has 100 million stars in it, excuse me, 100 billion stars in it. The nearest star take you 40,000 years. So the question, what does it take to become interstellar space? We either have to figure out a way to live a really long time mm. or send a crew of astronauts that are really fertile so that <laughs> the 80th generation down the line is the one who lands at the destination. Or we have to find out something new about the fabric of space and time so that we can basically invoke the famous warp drive engines that are common in Star Trek, allowing them to cross the galaxy during the TV commercial. Jean LaCharon tweets, I love that. What can we expect the North and South Poles to shift? When can we expect them to shift? And what manifestations will we experience? They don't shift. <laughs> they don't shift. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of talk about pole shifting as we went into the year 2012, all well, the 2012 hysteria, which was basically a hoax on scientifically illiterate people of the world. And so uh, the pole, uh, Earth rotates, and the pole bobs up and down over tens of thousands of years, and we, and we oscillate like this the way a top does. When you see a top begin to slow down, nobody plays with tops anymore. I but, love tops. Well, well, you gotta love a top. I play with I them. I love them. You spin it, and then it, it, it begins to... Yeah, I love that. The, the official word is precess. We do that, and we do one full procession every 26,000 years. We don't flip. One other thing. Do you still, is there still a little boy in you that looks up and wonders? I, the, the little boy has never left. In fact, a scientist is a child who has never grown up. Because you've been in rooms with kids, they're poking at things and, and they're near breaking everything. And the, what is the adult telling them? To not, you know, slow down, stop. We, we spend the first year of a kid's life teaching them to walk and talk and the rest of their lives telling them to shut up and sit down. We squash. <laughs> the creativity that is built into our DNA. And the few who survive these, these squelching forces of surrounding adults, they become scientists. Incredible, thank you, Neil. It's over? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, what can I say? See you next time.